Hey everyone, welcome to our Winter Vibe service. Happy Boxing Day. Uh, typically as a church, we take time between Christmas and New Year's for our staff and volunteers to unplug and have a break. We're so grateful for everyone who served and loved and worked on content during the Advent season. So grateful for all your participation and your generosity. Uh, this moment of connection we have now comes at a time when we're still feeling the glow of Christmas joy, but also beginning to look ahead to the new year and new beginnings. And as I look ahead, I can't see anything but adventure ahead of us. Uh, we are still in a time of uncertainty. We are still navigating another uptick in intensity surrounding the pandemic. There's still loads of cultural shift ahead. And as we look to 2022, we see an incredible need for the church to be more faithful than ever in our passion to be true followers of Jesus. This is where the story of Mary and Joseph picks up. Vince will be sharing a word from the scriptures about that for us in just a moment. Uh, Vince gives us a wonderful look at some of the historical context of the Christmas story and what follows uh, the flight to Egypt story of Joseph and Mary. After the shepherds and the angels, after the wise men have come and gone, life gets even more practical and gritty and adventurous for Mary and Joseph. And the baby Jesus, they, like us, found themselves in a time that requires courage and with a need to be more faithful than ever in their passion to be true followers of God. Before we worship, uh, let's read Psalm 116 together. Psalm 116 speaks of how we take refuge in God, how we find security in Him, and this is what we need as we carry the story of the gospel uh, with us, trusting God on our adventure, just as Mary and Joseph did on their adventure of faithfulness uh, in protecting and caring for the Son of God. We are called to carry uh, the gospel with us and to hold it and we need protection and care as we do so psalm 116 keep me safe my god for in you i take refuge i say to the lord you are my lord apart from you i have no good thing i say of the holy people who are in the land they are the noble ones in whom is my delight those who run after other gods will suffer more and more I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me, even at night my heart instructs me i keep my eyes always on the lord with him at my right hand i will not be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. As we worship, let's sing Waymaker together. Uh, the lyric in the song that anchors uh, my heart is, you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. As we look towards 2022, let's put our trust in Jesus all the more. I worship you, I 
worship you Because you are a way maker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are Lord, in that song, we just repeatedly sang the line, that is who you are. Father, I pray that uh, we would be completely anchored as people around uh, the idea of who you are, that your nature would be our target, that your character would be our goal. Uh, just as we begin to examine the story of Mary and Joseph, uh, we would see things in Joseph's character and Mary's character that are reflections of you. Uh, we would see uh, who you are, who you're calling us to be in this time. We would be people of faithfulness, people of generosity, people of grace. Lord, would you uh, move in our hearts, move in our lives as we read the word. Uh, thank you so much for Vince and preparing this message for us. Ask your blessing on him. Uh, we're grateful we receive your word, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody, OVC. And I hope you've had a wonderful Christmas on uh, this Boxing Day and that your family times have been really blessed by the Lord. This morning, we're going to talk about an aspect of the Christmas story that doesn't get a lot of attention. I mean, everybody who knows the Christmas story certainly knows about uh, Herod's uh, evil intent. Uh, so we're going to kind of hone in on that a little bit uh, in the second part of, of this talk, but I want to set some background to that first to get a little bit of understanding of what the actual context of Herod's 
decision to do terrible things in Bethlehem was about. So we know the background, the original part, as we set this, the stage a little bit here and talk about the main players in the drama, if we could look at it that way. In the first part, of course, we know how Mary becomes pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Joseph is wondering what's going on with his uh, uh, fiance, and there's a bit of a crisis there until the Lord speaks to Joseph through an angel and tells him that this is uh, not what it looks like. And he goes ahead with the wedding, with the marriage. I don't know about the wedding, but with the marriage. And they end up being uh, required to go down to Bethlehem because of a Roman census, which is being held for taxation purposes. So the journey to, to Bethlehem, we don't pay too much attention to. We often see it pictured as they have a donkey because Mary is pregnant and walking with a hundred and plus miles or about 150, 60 kilometers would be quite a feat to do in her condition. When they get to Bethlehem, oh, the route um, is not a straight line. They would have avoided Samaria in those days and, and then gone down the east side of the Jordan River and crossed back over around Jericho. Um, we traced that path when we were in Israel a few years ago. And uh, then they would have gone up not to Jerusalem, but maybe through Jerusalem and ended up in Bethlehem, which is about eight kilometers outside of uh, Jerusalem to the south. So they get to Bethlehem, and we usually get this bit in the story about the no room in the inn, but a little bit of understanding there. Um, first, there was no inn in Bethlehem. Uh, the translation that we've had isn't for that is an old word, I mean, it's an old English translation. The Greek word is actually more like guest room, which means that there was a space in a home that was used for guests arriving, and this was a fairly common practice. The timing uh, is, is interesting too, but uh, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit, a little bit later, uh, the actual timing of these events. So there they are in Bethlehem. The birth takes place in what is really the animal pen of a home. And the homes in those days usually had two levels. The, the homes in Israel in those days, very common for them to have two levels. The bottom level is where the livestock would have been, if they had it, would have been kept and maybe other things that they would store and there might be some pens down there. And the upper level was the living quarters and if there was a, a home which was used for guests as well, they would have had, it would have been a, lar a bit of a larger home with space for guests to come and bed down in. And it was a large common area. This was not unlike what we think of with inn or hotel, with rooms and privacy and all of that. And so the innkeeper here, where we're told is actually a homeowner, uh, was not being cruel when he suggested to them that for privacy's sake and Mary's condition going into labor, she probably didn't want to be in that big common room up there uh, with all kinds of people because the town was overloaded with people that had come in to register for for the census. And so going down into the pen, yeah, bit smelly, bit uh, maybe not the cleanest, but much more private because there wouldn't be a whole lot of people down there. So just to clear that up, that the innkeeper is not being cruel or uncompassionate in doing this. He's actually being as helpful as he probably can be in the situation. The other point here is that this is the hometown of their ancestors, their Davidic ancestors. They're both from David's clan that comes from that area, Beit Lachem in, in Hebrew, which means house of bread. And, and so they, everybody in the town is probably some kind of distant relation to them. And, and so there's some degree of relationship here, and in, in the laws of hospitality of the, of the culture of those days in the Middle East, uh, he would have been obligated to do the best he could for them, uh, and especially since they were kin. So just to clear a few of those details up, it's interesting to do that. So there we have the situation. Um, in the slides here, there's a, bit, a map to show the route they would have taken. Um, and then um, I talk about that 
uh, on here in, in some of these slides as well about the inn, etc. There's a portrait here of the typical house in, in, Jude, in Judah in those days or Judea in those days. And uh, so the stable is the more private place. It's not the living quarters and it'll be a better place to, uh, for Mary to give birth. Now, it talks about shepherds in the story. Again, some of these details are, uh, to just give context here, this play, the area around Bethlehem is prime sheep herding country, or it was in those days. It's built up now, and I doubt they have a whole lot of sheep flocks running around there, but it's built up. Uh, but in those days, this was shepherding country. This is where David, a thousand years previously, had kept his flocks. It's the same, same idea. Bethlehem in the, in the time of uh, Jesus, in the time of David, not a lot bigger uh, in, in size in, in between the two times. David had been a shepherd there a thousand years previously. It's no surprise we find sheep there. The season also is that when the sheep would come down from the higher mountains to, to do lambing and stuff so that they could be close to, uh, to uh, where the owners were and that kind of thing. So this suggests that this, the season was lambing season which is between September and early in the new year, at least our new year. Now we're talking about Jewish calendar in those days, but uh, from us, our perspective, this is probably September, October-ish, which suggests that Jesus wasn't born in December, uh, which, uh, you know, it's one of those romantic things we have, you know, white Christmas and all of that. Well, probably not in the original version. <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, you can, you can still have your fun with White Christmas and all that. It suggests it might have been around the time of Yom Kippur, or the Feast of Trumpets, which are the two, two of the major Jewish festivals in the, in the fall. And then, if you think of that prophetically, it's very profound. If Jesus was born in or around, especially if he happened to be, which God could certainly arrange for him to be actually born, on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Trumpets, wow, the Savior of the world born on the Day of Atonement, the Redeemer born on the day when the Jewish people uh, fasted and prayed and pay attention to the Lord to repent from their sins, wow, okay? Or the Feast of Trumpets where you have you know, the blowing of the trumpets to celebrate the giving of the law, and here is the ultimate law keeper perhaps born on this day where the trumpets are sounding and that gives a context to the angels singing and who knows maybe having a few trumpets uh, to celebrate this coming of the Messiah into the world pretty amazing if that was the case we don't know that's the thing so we're going to have a few other characters show up in this story what I'm going to do is just read a little bit from uh, the complete Jewish Bible, some of the story of what happens with the Magi here. Okay, and we know this. Uh, Aaron referred to it a few weeks ago, uh, so we know some. Uh, we know most of this story anyway. But the Magi, to give uh, an idea, so we're going to enter into the time uh, of of the main topic we're talking about, which is the flight of the Holy Family to Egypt, which is one of the parts of the story that often just kind of, yeah, okay, they had to get away from this cruel guy named Herod. So the Magi come, and as Aaron, as Aaron mentioned, they probably came from Persia, because the Magi were a, members of an exclusive order of astrologers, astronomers. They didn't separate those two things in those days. Today, that would be Iran. They were sages, or mages, if you like. They weren't magicians. So don't confuse magi with magicians here. That's not who they were. They were not sorcerers and things like some people have suggested. They were investigators of supernatural signs and wonders, interpreters of, this, of the signs that the gods sent. They, as, as Persians, were not polytheists. This is one of the things that sometimes gets confused. Uh, they didn't un quite understand God the way that, let's say, the, the Jewish people did. But they, they believed there was a high God, and, and they may have been Zoroastrians, but they would have believed in the God of light as opposing the forces of darkness, which is uh, 
probably more like they were. They knew something about the Jewish scriptures too. It's very clear here that they, they did. There's a slide here showing the uh, traditional three names of the Magi with them coming with their gifts. Um, and uh, Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar, and they're carrying these three gifts. And they're dressed in this, in this portrayal, which is a, uh, a very early one. It was found on a wall somewhere. Um, in, in, dressed in very Persian costumes here, which is like totally appropriate, which would verify that that's where they were from. So, how did the Magi know about this birth of this coming king? Remember that the Jewish people had been exiled into Babylon. And when they were exiled into Babylon, they carried their scriptures with them. And then Daniel's story, from uh, it, it, it takes place in Babylon, and it overlaps not only the Babylonians, but the beginning of the Persian period. And so Daniel's story probably got written, partly at least we know, in Aramaic, which was the common language that was used. And it could very well have been copied multiple times. Uh, there was respect for the Jewish sages through Daniel and, and, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And these Persian magi would have been very interested in this. So they probably had access at least to part of the story that Daniel had told. And they probably uh, knew other, other prophecies about it as well. And this is what they were looking for and why somehow God showed them this was the time. I mean, we're not going to go into the possibilities of how that happened. Because it would take too much time. But here they are. They show up in Israel, in Judea. Um, looking for this newborn king. And of course, we know that Herod is horrified by this. It says that he is greatly disturbed here. Um, so when King Herod heard of this, he became very agitated. Uh, so did everyone else in Jerusalem, which is the Jewish way to say Jerusalem. He came, he called together all the head Kohanim and Torah teachers, priests and scribes, of the people and asked them, where will the Messiah be born? In Bethlehem, in Yehuda, they replied, because of the prophet. And then he quotes the prophecy from Micah. Herod summoned the Magi to meet with him privately and asked them exactly when the star had appeared. Time calculation. The Magi had been on the road to get there for some time, as Aaron pointed out before. <laughs> this was not like a walk across the park here. This is like a thousand miles. And so there's a long way to walk. And then he sent them on, and uh, they, they, they found the child, etc. And then they're warned not to go back to Herod, who's got evil intentions. So this is who the Magi were. But a little bit about Herod's reaction here. I said, why? Not only the fact that, you know, he might have a rival king on his hand, uh, but why did this disturb him? Why did it become so agitated? Herod did not feel secure on his throne because he was not Jewish. He was not Jewish. He was married. His first wife was a Jewish princess from the Hasmonean dynasty, which was also not a legitimate dynasty, but at any rate, he owed his throne, Herod owed his throne to the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus his own cunning as a polit political guy and some military success that he had. That's how he got the throne. And, he, and this gave him the power to, to, uh, to uh, receive the, Jewish, the rule of Judea from Caesar because he had helped Augustus and the Romans when the Parthians, who were in control of Persia and all that area east in those days, had actually invaded and overrun that whole area for a period of time around 40 and in the 30s before, uh, before Jesus was born. So here's Herod's thought process, quite possibly. Who are these dudes anyway? They're spies. They're coming in here to see and set up a rival to me. And that's to him, the arrival of these important dignitaries from Parthia smelled like a conspiracy. Now, of course, I'm reading into this, but this is a very reasonable historical 
reading in of the situation smell like a conspiracy to undermine him and claim the kingship for uh, somebody set, uh, set up by and backed by Parthia so that they could regain control of this area. This area was constantly being battled over between these two empires. Now, was Herod uh, above stooping to killing babies to do this? No, he had already killed his first wife and his oldest son for conspiring against them. He wouldn't stoop to killing a whole bunch of babies in this town. So here's where we see um, the situation develop that's going to lead to the Holy Family leaving and going to Egypt. This is commonly known as the flight to, into Egypt uh, in church history. And the hero of this story is somebody that we hardly ever pay attention to, except for it's like, oh yeah, the guy was married to the mother of the Messiah, and that's Joseph. Joseph is really the hero, the human hero of this story. Um, and, and so let's look at that. What do we know about Joseph? Not a lot. We know that he uh, heard several times from angels, which suggests that he was somebody who sought God's will and was willing to listen to it when he heard it. When he heard, he obeyed. From what we see in, and he obeyed without question this is what we see from his reactions throughout this whole story without going back but up right back to the time when he discovered that his fiance mary miriam was pregnant matthew is the only one of the gospel writers who really tells us anything at all about the man named joseph and what he tells us is pretty minimal except for that he listens to god through the angels and he, and he uses one word, a Greek word, dikaios, which means righteous. It's often translated as righteous. Uh, but what that one word speaks volumes about who this guy is, what kind of man he is, what kind of person he is. He is a truly good man. He's a compassionate man. He's a caring person who sought to love God and his neighbor and play his part. The other thing we know about him is that it's often described as a carpenter but the greek word that's used there is not just somebody who bangs nails to put up a frame for a home or something like that he is a skilled craftsman he's very skilled at what he does he can do everything from fine cabinetry to putting up a house if that's what he needed to do so he's an honorable man. His reaction to Mary's pregnancy was not to shame her in public, which he had every right to do, as uh, from the perspective of the culture back then, that he had been shamed by her you know, becoming pregnant, not through him. It wasn't uncommon, or let's say impossible, for a, uh, an engaged couple to, to uh, become pregnant before marriage. That was okay, but it, he wasn't the father. So this was a, this was a disgrace. But instead of doing that, he very, he very quietly thought, well, what am I going to do here until he's told what to do? So he's a man of rather exceptional character. So the story moves on from here. The Magi don't go back to Herod. Herod concludes that it really is a conspiracy because uh, they just uh, kind of did their secret business and took off. And so he says, I must act now. And, of course, we know that Joseph is again informed by the Lord that this is going to happen. And God intervenes in the middle of the night. It's very clear here in the story. Uh, after they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and there stay there until I tell you to leave, for Herod's going to look for the child in order to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother, and left during the night. No delay. Go now. Get out. <laughs> Split, man. You know, it's like, take whatever you can grab here. You're going to remail it. The other thing is that Mary and Joseph were not staying in the stable. They were now in a house. It says very clearly when they got there that they came to the house where they were. 
They had taken up residence there. This is not like Christmas Day. This is weeks, perhaps months later. And it sounds like they're staying in Bethlehem, not going back to Nazareth. That's what it sounds like from the story here, is that they decided, you know what? This is our ancestral home. Let's just stay here. Lots of kin, etc. But now it's total up, people. Leave everything. Go. Take whatever you can carry and get out and head to Egypt. So this is a traumatic upheaval in their situation. Egypt is not the closest place they could go to. And so why didn't they go to some place like, you know, Bethlehem, go down to Jericho, cross over and take off maybe to Petra or some place like that? Because all of that territory, Petra, the whole east of the Jordan, which in those days was called Arabia, and up all the way to Damascus, guess what? Who rules all of that? Herod. It's all his territory. Petra is part of the ancient kingdom of Edom, which in those in the days of the Bible is called Edomia. And Herod is an Edomian, which means he is actually the ruler of Petra, Edom, Edomia, all of that. That was his home territory. They can't go east. They can't go north. That's still going through his territory. Where do they go? The only place they can go is west to Egypt. And Egypt is, uh, it's not to jaunt across the lake here, okay? It's, by the time they walk, it's going to be 500 kilometers. Get up, leave, walk 500 kilometers. And with nothing but what you can carry here. And this is where the gifts of the Magi become enormously important because what did they have? They are not a rich couple. They haven't got a ton of money to go with here. So they need provision. And the other thing is that walking this, this idea that we often have is they, you know, they just walked this on their own and they were on their own all through this, this walk and everything. Not, on, not realistic at all. They would have, what they would have done is set off from Bethlehem middle of the night. They would not go through Jerusalem. That would be like, just not do that right? So they would have to cut south, pick up the road that goes out to the coast at Ascalon. Uh, we're talking about a little bit about the geography of Israel, Ascalon, and then south towards Gaza. Somewhere in Ascalon, Gaza, probably Gaza, they could pick up with a caravan or with an another group of people that are traveling. Because in those days, you did not go on these roads alone. And northern Sinai is deadly country. Just back then, it was notoriously full of bandits and brigands and all kinds of unsavory types. And uh, the remains of the Amalekites who hated Jews with passion, etc. So they would have probably joined up with somebody, with another group, having some money. If they didn't have a donkey, they probably would have got one. They got to be able to keep up here. Joseph could have offered himself to convince somebody that they were a safe bet to go along with them. Offered himself as a, maybe a drover for one of the merchants in the camel, uh, in the caravan, or perhaps uh, because he's got these skills, somebody who can fix anything. And you got a problem, I can fix it, sort of thing. Um, so it's it's very probable that they didn't travel alone. So to sojourn in Egypt, how long was this going to be? They don't know. They don't know. There's some irony in this. Matthew quotes the scripture of saying, Out of Egypt I called my son, you know, when they come back. But Matthew, Matthew is aware of the whole backstory of Israel originally came out of Egypt freed from slavery. 1,500 years before, the Lord had called his adopted son, Israel, out of slavery and idolatry in Egypt, led by Moses, the great deliverer. Now we've got the ultimate deliverer, the savior of the world, going back to Egypt. The son of God is going back to a pagan nation to get away from a nominally Jewish king who wants to kill Jewish babies, just like the Pharaoh of Egypt wanted to kill Jewish babies. 
So there's a kind of a little reverse here. And this is sort of like maybe a, you know, a promise that at some point, which is also in scripture, a promise that at some point Egypt is going to be redeemed, despite all its history. So, how long did they stay in Egypt? Where did they stay? We don't know exactly where they stayed. There's Coptic traditions. There's a, uh, a map here among the slides here, which shows this Coptic tradition uh, to uh, where they went, etc., etc. And according to Coptic tradition, they moved around a bit when they were there. We don't know how long it was, but it, however long it was, it was as long as it took Herod to die which raises the question of the dating, which I mentioned uh, some, a few minutes ago. Herod, according to calculations, died in 4 BC. And then you say, well, how could all this happen before Jesus was born? Well, obviously it didn't happen before it was born. The problem is that we got the dates wrong way back. The guy, a monk in about the 5th or 6th century, miscalculated when all of these things happened and we figured out since then um, that uh, you know he got it wrong so uh, some of the um, possibilities then we won't go into them um, is that Jesus was obviously born a little earlier than our dating has usually said Herod dies the angel comes and visits Joseph again, last time that we know about. Tells him they can go home, but he doesn't say. He just says, go, go back to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, because of the person or the persons that were seeking his death have, uh, are dead. So now Joseph may, has to make a choice about which place is he going back to, Bethlehem or Nazareth. Maybe the first inclination would have been to go back to Bethlehem. Because what we see in the story here is that um, the angel says to him, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to Eretz Israel, for those who wanted to kill the child are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to Eretz Israel. However, however, it seems like they set out and weren't sure where they were going to go. This is the however. When he heard that Archelaus, the son of Herod, had succeeded his father Herod as king of Yehuda, he was afraid to go there. So maybe he wasn't sure until he got the news of the guy who took over is this guy. And Archelaus, we know from Roman sources, because Matthew doesn't tell us this, but it's very clear in the Roman sources, this guy Archelaus was even possible, if it's possible to think, even worse than his dad, Herod, the wicked slaughterer of babies. In fact, he was so wicked that his own brothers, who we show up in the, later in the New Testament, were afraid of him. And they all fled because they were afraid that he would be even worse than dad and kill all his brothers, who could be potential rivals. And they fled to Rome and complained to Augustus. And eventually Augustus was so disgusted by this guy that he dethroned him and divided the thing up. And that's what we find the situation later in the New Testament. So Joseph says we meant to marry. We're going back to Nazareth. And that's, of course, how uh, we understand the rest of the story, where Jesus becomes Jesus of Nazareth. So just concluding here, it's a tragic story. It's a sad story, but it's also a very beautiful story. And one of the treasures, one of the pearls that comes out of this for me is an appreciation for this man, this, this humble man, this quiet man, this righteous man, Joseph. He doesn't get a great deal of fanfare. The Roman Catholics uh, made him the patron of families and um, the protector of children, okay? And you can understand why. Um, but here's Joseph, the earthly dad of Jesus, who steps up to the plate. And we could say, well, God would have found some way to save Jesus anyway. But that's just kind of idle talk, right? God had already chosen somebody for that role. He proved equal to the task. 
He was a man who sought God, who listened to God. And some people say, yeah, but he didn't have any choice. Well, he had the same kind of choice as you and I have every day about whether we're going to do what God tells us to or not. Joseph had that choice. And what he chose to do was what, act on what he knew. He had been told some very clear things. It's nice to when you got that clarity. But not every decision was made for him. It was just told generally, do this. And the rest is up to you, buddy. Is How are you going to do that? How are you going to save your family here? What are you going to do to protect them and provide for them? The New Testament Joseph, if we can run a little parallel with Old Testament Joseph, the story of Joseph from the Old Testament we're so familiar with, the coat of many colors and all of that. New Testament Joseph was one of the meekest and humblest heroes in biblical history. But what is clear to me as I think about it, consider it, he was a loving, compassionate husband and dad. Remember that this man was Jesus' dad on earth. Jesus grew up with him, learned from him. I mean, Jesus was not automatic that Jesus knew how to do everything or knew everything and all of that. He would have learned the profession. This is what happened in Jewish families. You, you pass the profession of dad to the oldest son, and Jesus is the oldest son. Joseph was ready to lay down his life, his reputation, by taking a, a girl that was already pregnant, not with his child, and his personal well-being for his life and family. He heard from God and did what he was told. He demonstrated wisdom and foresight. And as a mark of his humility, he disappears from the rest of the story. He didn't make a big fanfare out of it, and the church never made a very big fanfare of him. Like I say, we recognized him as a saint, and etc. Our tradition says that he dies before Jesus starts his public ministry, and we never see him. We see uh, mom is mentioned, and his, the rest of his family is mentioned. But he taught Jesus as much as a dad is supposed to. He demonstrated what it means to be a dedicated family man, a dedicated provider, a loving husband, a loving father. And he also was a respected craftsman, which meant that he would have been respected within his community, sat among the elders of the community, etc. None of that is mentioned. I believe that some of Jesus' parables and Jesus talks about building houses and things here and there, you know? How to build a house properly and make it stand and stuff like that. Jesus learned that from his dad. And there are other things that, he would, that are demonstrated too. That they would have worked together on work sites, on building sites, in the workshop, constructing things, learning all kinds of skills. Jesus was not some softy dude here. Okay, let's get rid of that namby-pamby image we have him. He was not that. He was a working man, had calluses on his hands, knew what it was like to work hard. And probably as a skilled craftsman, traveled around, uh, quite a bit around Galilee and knew some of those towns already, etc. There was a large family there. Certain traditions don't like, don't like to recognize that, but Jesus had four brothers, and they're all named twice in the New Testament. James, who wrote the letter of James. Joseph, another one we don't know much about. Simon, another one. But then there's Jude, who also wrote a letter in the New Testament. Two New Testament letters were by Jesus' brothers. And he had some unnamed sisters. We don't know how many. So they had a large family. Jesus knew what it was like to live in a family with all of the friction and rubbing. And, and we see that in an episode or two other places. We won't talk about that. So my assessment here, and this is where uh, what comes out of this story, uh, this really sad, dramatic, but in a sense beautiful story. Joseph of Nazareth is as important in salvation history as Joseph of the Old Testament, who saved his family in those bad days back then, in famine, all that. He's as important as people, in a sense here, like Abraham, or even Moses, or King David, because he was key 
in making sure the Redeemer and the Savior grew up to be, as a man, a man of God. And the other thing I like about him is there's no skeletons in his closet. <laughs> you look at this list here, they've all got skeletons in their closet, I and mean, we won't go through that. So I hope this has been informative to some degree for you, and uh, I wish you well, and another Merry Christmas. Thank you, Jesus, for that message. Uh, thank you uh, for this call to courage. Thank you for this call uh, to uh, faithfulness. Uh, help us live as Joseph's. Uh, help us live as kind and generous and practical, uh, listening and faithful people. Call us to courage in these days. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks, Vince. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, what an amazing story. Uh, we don't often take the time to just pick up where Christmas left off as we look at that story and look at our own journey. Um, we just want to enter in and we want to worship. We want to thank God uh, and enter into maybe another song about God's presence with us on that adventure. Uh, let's celebrate his sovereignty. Let's express to God just how much we trust him. Uh, we trust him in the calm. We trust him in the storm. Uh, he's with us in the dark. He's with us in the dawn. Lord, bless us uh, and prepare us for, for great adventures, we pray. Amen. Let's worship. I
Whatever comes our way, we will trust you. We will trust you, Jesus. We will trust you in the calm. We will trust you in the storm. We will trust you uh, with everything, with our whole lives. We declare our faith in you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Cool. Well, God bless you, OVC. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Praying for you an amazing week and really look forward to seeing you when we gather again. Uh, Next Sunday will be our traditional pastor on the hot seat Sunday. So come prepared with your questions. Uh, Anything goes and we'll just have a conversation together about the stuff that's on your minds and on your hearts. Really looking forward to that. Also, please remember uh, OVC and our shared mission uh, when you consider year end giving this week. Uh, We have an amazing uh, journey here. We have an incredible challenge to bring the gospel and to plant and grow this church in some pretty hard ground. Really need your support. Uh, So now maybe just a little benediction to close us out. Lord, be with us now to strengthen us, about us to keep us, above us to protect us, beneath us to uphold us, before us to direct us behind us to keep us from straying and round about us to defend us. Blessed are you, O Father, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, OVV. Hope you have an amazing, amazing week. Love you. Uh, We'll be praying for you and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers.